From the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Saturday evening session of the 193rd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session is provided by a choir comprised of young single adults residing in Utah County. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Dallin H. Oaks, first counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you most warmly to the Saturday evening session of the 193rd Semiannual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who is viewing this session at home, has asked me to conduct this session. We welcome all who are participating in these proceedings by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. The music for this session will be provided by a choir composed of young single adults residing in Utah County under the direction of Aaron Bailey with Joseph Peebles at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing, Let Zion in Her Beauty Rise. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Clark G. Gilbert of the 70, after which the choir will sing, Lead Kindly Light. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the power and direction and clarity with which we have been taught in this general conference. We're mindful of the needs of President Nelson and would ask 
blessings on him, we feel his strength and his guidance, even in his absence. Please bless also Elder Jeffrey R. Holland and strengthen him. If there are any this evening who have come seeking direction and light and truth in their lives, or those who are struggling and need comfort, may they find it in the messages and through the Spirit in these meetings this evening. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
We will now be pleased to hear from Elders Gary B. Sabin and Joni L. Koch of the 70. Following their remarks, the choir will sing, I Believe in Christ. We will then hear from Sister Tamara W. Runia, who serves as First Counselor in the Young Women General Presidency. While on a business trip several years ago, I found myself seated next to a man from the Netherlands. I was eager to visit with him since I had served in Belgium and the Netherlands as a young missionary. As we became acquainted, he gave me his business card with the unique job title of Professor of Happiness. I commented on his amazing profession and asked him what a professor of happiness did. He said he taught people how to have a happy life by establishing meaningful relationships and goals. I replied, that's wonderful, but what if you could also teach how those relationships can continue beyond the grave and answer other questions of the soul, such as what is the purpose of life? How can we overcome our weaknesses? And where do we go after we die? He admitted that it would be amazing if we had the answers to those questions, and I was pleased to share with him that we do. Today I would like to review a few essential principles for true happiness that seem to elude so many in this confusing world where many things are interesting, but few are truly important. Alma taught the people of his day, For behold, I say unto you, there be many things to come, and behold, there is one thing which is of more importance than they all. For behold, the time is not far distant that the Redeemer liveth and cometh among his people. This declaration is equally important to us today as we anticipate and prepare for Christ's second coming. Therefore, my first observation is that building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ is essential to our happiness. This is a sure foundation, a foundation whereon if men build, they cannot fall. Doing so prepares us for the challenges of life, come what may. Many years ago, I went to a summer scout camp with our son Justin. As the activities got underway, he excitedly announced that he and his friends wanted to earn the archery merit badge. Doing so required the boys to pass a short written test and hit a target with their arrows. My heart sank. At the time, Justin was quite frail due to cystic fibrosis, a disease he had been battling since birth. I wondered if he could pull the bow back far enough to send the arrow to the target. As he and his friends left for the archery class, I silently prayed that he would not be humiliated by the experience. A couple of anxious hours later, I saw him coming up the path toward me with a big smile. Dad, he exclaimed, I got the merit badge. I got a bullseye. It was on the target next to mine, but I hit a bullseye. <laughs> he had pulled the bull back with all his might and let the arrow fly, unable to control its trajectory. How grateful I am for that understanding archery instructor who never said, sorry, wrong target. Rather, upon seeing Justin's obvious limitations and earnest effort, he kindly responded, Good job. That is how it will be for us if we do our very best to follow Christ and His prophets in spite of our limitations. If we come unto Him by keeping our covenants and repenting of our sins, we will joyfully hear our Savior's commendation, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I bear you my witness of the divinity of the Savior of the world and of His redemptive love and power to heal, strengthen, and lift us when we are earnestly striving to come unto Him. Conversely, there is no way we can move with the crowd and also toward Jesus. The Savior has defeated death, disease, and sin and has provided a way for our, ult our ultimate perfection if we will follow Him with all of our hearts. My second observation is that it is crucial to our happiness that we remember that we are sons and daughters of a loving Heavenly Father. Knowing and trusting this reality changes everything. Several years ago, on a flight home from a church assignment, Sister Sabin and I found ourselves seated directly behind a very large man who had a big, angry face tattooed on the back of his bald head, as well as the number 439. When we landed, I said, Excuse me, sir. Do you mind if I ask the significance of the number tattooed on the back of your head? I didn't dare ask about the angry face. <laughs> he said, that's me. That's who I am. I own that territory. 219. 
439 was the actual number on his head, so I was surprised he got it wrong since it was so important to him. I, I thought how sad it was that this man's identity and self-esteem were based on a number associated with a gang territory. I thought to myself, this tough-looking man was once somebody's little boy once, who still needed to feel valued and to belong. If only he knew who he really was and to whom he really belonged, for we have all been bought with a price. There is a wise line in the song from the film The Prince of Egypt that states, look at your life through heaven's eyes. As the knowledge of our divine lineage and eternal potential sinks deep into our souls, we will be able to view life as a purposeful, unfolding adventure to learn and grow from, even as we see through a glass darkly for a short season. The third hallmark for happiness is to always remember the worth of a soul. We do this best by following the Savior's admonition, love one another as I have loved you. He also taught, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. The book of Proverbs wisely counsels, withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. We will never regret being too kind. In God's eyes, kindness is synonymous with greatness. Part of being kind is being forgiving and non-judgmental. Many years ago, our young family was going to see a movie for family home evening. We were all in the van except for one of our sons and my wife, Valerie. It was dark outside, and as our son threw open the door and ran toward the car, he accidentally kicked what he thought was our cat on the porch. Unfortunately for our son and my wife, who was right behind him, it was not our cat, but rather a very unhappy skunk who let them know it. We all returned to the house where they both showered and washed their hair with tomato juice, the supposed sure remedy to eliminate skunk odor. By the time they had cleaned up and changed their clothes, we were all desensitized to any odor, so we decided we were okay to go to the movie after all. <laughs> Once we were seated at the back of the theater, one by one the people around us suddenly decided to go out to get popcorn. <laughs> when they came back, however, no one returned to their original seat. We have laughed as we recalled that experience. But what if all of our sins had an odor? What if we could smell dishonesty, lust, envy, or pride? With our, weak, with our weaknesses revealed, we would hopefully be a little more considerate and careful of others, and likewise they with us as we make the needed changes in our lives. I actually love the smell of tobacco in church because it indicates someone is trying to change. They need our welcoming arms around them. President Russell M. Nelson has wisely said, one of the easiest ways to identify a true follower of Jesus Christ is how compassionately that person treats other people. Paul, said, Paul wrote to the Ephesians, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are asked to trust Heavenly Father and our Savior and not attempt to replace them. Jesus Christ knows everyone's imperfections perfectly and will judge them perfectly. My fourth happiness hallmark is to maintain an eternal perspective. Our Father's plan stretches into the eternities. It is easy to focus on the here and now and forget the hereafter. I was taught this lesson powerfully a number of years ago by our then 16-year-old daughter, Jennifer. She was about to have a double lung transplant where the five diseased lobes of her lungs would be completely removed and replaced by two healthy, smaller lobes donated by two amazing Christ-like friends. It was a very high-risk procedure. Yet the night before her surgery, Jennifer almost preached to me with all of her 90 pounds, saying, Don't worry, Dad. Tomorrow I will wake up with new lungs, or I will wake up in a better place. Either way will be great. That is faith. That is eternal perspective. Seeing life from an eternal vantage point provides clarity, comfort, courage, and hope. After the surgery, when the long-awaited day came to remove the breathing tube and turn off the ventilator that had been helping Jennifer breathe, we anxiously waited to see if her two smaller lobes would work. 
When she took her first breath, she immediately started crying. Seeing our concern, she quickly exclaimed, It's just so good to breathe. Ever since that day, I have thanked Heavenly Father morning and night for my ability to breathe. We are surrounded by innumerable blessings that we can easily take for granted if we are not mindful. Conversely, when nothing is expected and everything is appreciated, life becomes magical. President Nelson has said, Each new morning is a gift from God. Even the air we breathe is a loving loan from Him. He preserves us from day to day and supports us from one moment to another. Therefore, our first noble deed of the morning should be a humble prayer of gratitude. That brings me to my fifth and final observation, which is, you will never be happier than you are grateful. The Lord declared, And he who receiveth all things with thankfulness shall be made glorious. Perhaps this is because gratitude gives birth to a multitude of other virtues. How our awareness would change if every morning we awoke with only the blessings we were grateful for the night before. Failure to appreciate our blessings can result in a sense of dissatisfaction which can rob us of the joy and happiness that gratitude engenders. Those in the great and spacious building entice us to look beyond the mark, thereby missing the mark entirely. In reality, the greatest happiness and blessing of mortality will be found in whom we have become through God's grace as we make and keep sacred covenants with Him. Our Savior will polish and refine us through the merits of His atoning sacrifice, and as said of those who willingly follow Him, they shall be mine in that day when I shall come to make up my jewels. I promise you that if we build our lives upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, value our true identity as sons and daughters of God, remember the worth of a soul, maintain an eternal perspective, and gratefully appreciate our many blessings, especially Christ's invitation to come unto Him, we can find the true happiness we seek during this mortal adventure. Life will still have its challenges, but we will be able to better face each with a sense of purpose and peace because of the eternal truths we understand and live by. I bear you my witness of the reality of God, our loving Father, and of His beloved Son, Jesus Christ. I also testify of living prophets, seers, and revelators. What a blessing it is to receive the counsel of heaven through them. As the Savior clearly stated, whether by my own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. <clears throat> In the fifth chapter of Alma, an introspective question is posed. Could he say if you were called to die at this time within yourselves that he have been sufficiently humble? A question implies that humility is a mandatory requirement for us to be ready to return to the presence of God. We all like to think we are sufficiently humble, but some experiences in life make us realize that the natural, prideful man often is very much alive within us. Years ago, when our two daughters were still living at home, I decided to show them and my wife the business unit and, uh, for which I was in charge and the company I worked for. <clears throat> my real purpose, though, was to show them a place where, unlike our home, everyone would do exactly what I asked them to do without questioning me. As we arrived at the front gate, which usually opened automatically when my car approached, I was surprised that it didn't open this time. Instead, a security guard I had never seen before in my life came to the car and asked me for my company ID. I told him I never needed an ID to drive into the property with my car, and then asked him the classic prideful person question. Do you know who you're talking to? <clears throat> to which he replied, Well, since you don't have your company ID, I cannot know who you are. And while I'm at this gate, you will not be allowed to enter the premises without a proper identification. I thought about uh, looking at the rear view mirror to check my daughter's reaction to all that. But I knew they were savoring every second of that moment. My wife at my side was shaking her head in disapproval of my behavior. 
My last resort then was to apologize to the guard and say I was very sorry for, the tr for treating him so badly. You're forgiven, he said, but without a company ID, you're not coming in today. <laughs> I then drove very slowly back home to get my ID, having perhaps learned this valuable lesson that when we choose not to be humble, we end up being humiliated. In Proverbs, we find, a man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. In order to develop hum humility, we must understand what it really means in the context of the gospel. Some people confuse being humble with other things, such as, for example, being poor. But there are many, actually, that are poor and prideful, and also many who are rich and yet humble. Others who are very shy or have uh, low self-esteem may have an outward appearance of humility, but deep inside are full of pride sometimes. Then what is humility? According to Preach My Gospel, it is a willingness to submit to the will of the Lord. It is being teachable. It is a vital catalyst for spiritual growth. There are certainly many opportunities for us all to improve in this Christ-like attribute. <clears throat> I would like to explore first how humble we've been or should be in following the counsel of our prophet. A pop quiz for us individually could be, do we mention the full name of the church in all our interactions? President Nelson said, quote, to remove the Lord's name from the Lord's church is a major victory for Satan." Unquote. Are we letting God prevail in our lives by accepting our prophet's very specific invitation? Quote, Today I call upon our members everywhere to lead out in abandoning attitudes and actions of prejudice. Unquote. Are we overcoming the world trusting the doctrine of Christ more than the philosophies of men, as our prophet taught? Have we become peacemakers, saying positive things to and about people? President Nelson taught us last General Conference the following, quote, if there is anything virtuous, lovely, of good report or praiseworthy that we can say about another person, whether to his face or behind her back, that should be our standard of communication." Unquote. These are simple but powerful instructions. Remember, all the people of Moses had to do to be healed was to look at the brass serpent which he had lifted up. But because of the simpleness of the way or the easiness of it, there were many who perished. During this conference, we have heard and will yet hear the unfailing counsel of our prophets and apostles. It's a perfect occasion to develop humility and let our strong opinions be swallowed by an even stronger conviction that the Lord does speak through these chosen leaders. Above all, in developing humility, we must also understand and accept that we are not able to overcome our challenges or to achieve our full potential through our own efforts only. Motivational speakers, writers, coaches, and influencers around the world, especially on digital platforms, will say that everything depends solely on us and our actions. The world believes in the arm of flesh. But through the restored gospel, we have learned that we greatly depend on Heavenly Father's benevolence in the atonement of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. That's why it's so important 
to make and keep covenants with God, as doing so will give us full access to the healing, enabling, and perfecting power of Jesus Christ through His Atonement. Attending sacrament meeting weekly, worshiping at the temple regularly to participate in the ordinances and to receive and renew covenants is a sign that we recognize our dependence on Heavenly Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That will invite their power into our lives to help us through all our problems and ultimately fulfill the measure of our creation. Not long ago, the level of my humility and understanding of my dependence of, on the Lord was once again tested. I was in a taxi going to the airport to catch a short flight to a place where there was a very difficult situation to solve. The taxi driver, who was not a member of the church, looked at me through the mirror and said, I can see you're not well today. Could you tell? I asked. Of course, he said. Then he said something like, you actually have a very negative halo around you. <laughs> I explained to him that I had quite a hard situation to deal with. When he then asked me, have you done everything in your power to resolve, to solve this? I responded, I had done everything I could. He then said something I never forgot. So leave these in God's hands and everything will work out fine. I confess that I was tempted to ask him, do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> but I didn't. <clears throat> what I did was to humble myself before the Lord throughout that one hour flight, asking for divine help. As I left the airplane, I had learned that the difficult situation to be solved was already in order, that my presence there wouldn't even be necessary anymore. Brothers and sisters, the command, invitation, and promise from the Lord is clear and comforting. Be thou humble, and the Lord thy God shall lead thee by the hand and give thee answer to thy prayers. May we, humble, may we be humble to follow the counsel of our prophets and accept that only God and Jesus Christ can transform us through ordinances and covenants received in His Church into our best version of ourselves in this life and one day make us perfect in Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
When our youngest daughter, Berkeley was little, I started using reading glasses, the kind that zoom in and magnify everything. One day as we sat together reading a book, I looked at her with love, but also sadness, because suddenly she seemed so grown up. I thought, where has the time gone? She's so big. As I lifted my reading glasses to wipe away a tear, I realized, oh wait, she's not bigger. It's just these glasses. Never mind. <laughs> Sometimes all we can see is that up-close magnified view of those we love. Tonight, I invite you to zoom out and look through a different lens, an eternal lens that focuses on the big picture, your bigger story. During humankind's early push into space, the unmanned rockets had no windows, but by the Apollo 8 mission to the moon, the astronauts had one. While floating in space, they were struck by the power of seeing our Earth and took this spectacular image, capturing the whole world's attention. Those astronauts experienced a sensation so powerful it has been given its own name, the overview effect. Viewing from a new vantage point changes everything. One space traveler said it reduces things to a size you think is manageable. We can do this. Peace on Earth? No problem. It gives people that type of energy, that type of power. As humans, we have an earthbound point of view, but God sees the grand overview of the universe. He sees all creation, all of us, and is filled with hope. Is it possible to begin to see as God sees while living on the surface of this planet, to feel this overview feeling? I believe we can, through the eye of faith, zoom out and view ourselves and our families with hope and joy. And the scriptures agree. Moroni speaks about those whose faith was exceedingly strong and that they truly saw with an eye of faith and they were glad. With an eye focused on the Savior, they felt joy and knew this truth. Because of Christ, it all works out. Everything you and you and you are worried about, it's all going to be okay. And those who look with an eye of faith can feel that it's going to be okay now. I went through a rough patch my senior year in high school when I wasn't making great choices. I remember seeing my mom crying and wondering if I had disappointed her. At the time, I worried that her tears meant she'd lost hope for me. And if she didn't feel hope for me, maybe there wasn't a way back. But my dad was more practiced at zooming out and taking the long view. He had learned from experience that worry feels a lot like love, but it's not the same. He used the eye of faith to see everything would work out, and his hopeful approach changed me. When I graduated from high school and went to BYU, my dad sent letters reminding me of who I was. He became my cheerleader and everybody needs a cheerleader. Someone who isn't telling you you're not running fast enough. They're lovingly reminding you that you can. Dad exemplified Lehi's dream. Like Lehi, he knew that you don't chase after your loved ones who feel lost. You stay where you are and you call them. You go to the tree, you stay at the tree, keep eating the fruit and with a smile on your face, continue to beckon to those you love and show by example that eating the fruit is a happy thing. This visual image has helped me during low moments when I find myself at the tree, eating the fruit and crying because I'm worried. And really, how helpful is that? Instead, let's choose hope. Hope in our Creator and in one another, fueling our ability to be better than we are right now. Shortly after Elder Neil A. Maxwell passed away, a reporter asked his son what he'd miss most. He said dinners at his parents' house because he always left feeling like his dad believed in him. This was around the same time our adult children were starting to come home for Sunday dinners with their spouses. During the week, I found myself making lists in my mind of things I could remind them of on Sunday, like maybe try and help out more with the kids when you're home, 
or don't forget to be a good listener. When I read Brother Maxwell's comment, I threw away the list and silenced that critical voice. So when I saw my grown children for that brief time each week, I focused on the many positive things they were already doing. And when our oldest son Ryan passed away a few years later, I remember being grateful our time together was happier and more positive. Before we interact with a loved one, can we ask ourselves this question? Is what I'm about to do or say helpful or hurtful? Because our words are one of our superpowers, and family members are like human blackboards standing in front of us saying, write what you think of me. These messages, whether intentional or unintentional, should be hopeful and encouraging. Our job is not to teach someone who's going through a rough patch that they are bad or disappointing. On rare occasions, we may feel prompted to correct, but most often, let's tell our loved ones in spoken and unspoken ways the messages they long to hear. Our family feels whole and complete because you are in it. You will be loved for the rest of your life, no matter what. Sometimes what we need is empathy more than advice, listening more than a lecture, Someone who hears and wonders, how would I have to feel to say what they just said? Remember, families are a God-given laboratory where we're figuring things out, so missteps and miscalculations are not just possible, but probable. And wouldn't it be interesting if at the end of our lives we could see that those relationships, even those challenging moments, were the very things that helped us to become more like our Savior? Each difficult interaction is an opportunity to learn how to love at a deeper level, a godlike level. Let's zoom out to view family relationships as the powerful vehicle to teach us the lessons we came here to learn as we turn to the Savior. Let's admit, in a fallen world, there's no way to be a perfect spouse, parent, son, daughter, grandchild, mentor, or friend, but a million ways to be a good one. Let's stay at the tree, partake of the love of God, and share it. By lifting the people around us, we ascend together. Unfortunately, the memory of eating the fruit is not enough. We need to partake again and again in ways that reposition our lens and connect us to the heavenly overview. By opening up the scriptures, which are filled with light, to chase away the darkness. Staying on our knees until our casual prayer turns mighty. This is when hearts soften and we begin to see as God sees. In these last days, perhaps our greatest work will be with our loved ones, good people living in a wicked world. Our hope changes the way they see themselves and who they really are. And through this lens of love, they'll see who they will become. But the adversary does not want us or our loved ones to return home together. And because we live on a planet that is bound by time and a finite number of years, he tries to perpetuate a very real sense of panic in us. It's hard to see when you're zoomed in that our direction matters more than our speed. Remember, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Thankfully, the God we worship is not bound by time. He sees who our loved ones really are and who we really are, so he's patient with us, hoping we'll be patient with each other. I will admit there are times when Earth, our temporal home, feels like an island of sorrow, moments when I have one eye of faith and the other eye is weeping. Do you know this feeling? I had it Tuesday. Can we instead choose the faithful posture of our prophet when he promises miracles in our families? If we do, our joy will increase even if turbulence increases. He is promising that an overview effect can be experienced now, regardless of our circumstances. Having this eye of faith now is a recapturing or an echo of the faith we had before we came to this planet. It sees past the uncertainty of a moment allowing us to cheerfully do all things that lie in our power and then stand still. Is there something difficult in your life right now? Something you're worried can't be resolved? Without the eye of faith, that might feel like God has lost oversight of things, and is that true? Or maybe your greater fear is that you're going to go through this difficult time all by yourself, but that would mean that God has abandoned you, and is that true? It is my witness that the Savior has the ability, because of His Atonement, to turn any nightmare you are going through into a blessing. He has given us a promise with an immutable covenant that as we strive to love and follow Him, all things wherewith we have been afflicted shall work together for our good. All things. And because we are children of the covenant, we can ask for this hopeful feeling now. 
While our families aren't perfect, we can perfect our love for others until it becomes a constant, unchanging, no matter what kind of love. The type of love that supports change and allows for growth and return. It is the Savior's work to bring our loved ones back. It is His work and His timing. It is our work to provide the hope and a heart they can come home to. We have neither God's authority to condemn nor His power to redeem, but we have been authorized to exercise His love. President Nelson has also taught that others need our love more than our judgment. They need to experience the pure love of Jesus Christ reflected in our words and actions. Love is the thing that changes hearts. It is the purest motive of all, and others can feel it. Let's hold fast to these prophetic words offered 50 years ago. No home is a failure unless it quits trying. Surely those who love the most and the longest win. In earthly families, we're simply doing what God has done with us, pointing the way and hoping our loved ones will go in that direction, knowing the path they travel is theirs to choose. And when they pass to the other side of the veil and draw close to that loving gravitational pull of their heavenly home, I believe it will feel familiar because of how they were loved here. Let's use that overview lens and see the people we love and live with as shared companions on this beautiful planet. You and I, we can do this. We can hold on and hope on. We can stay at the tree, partake of the fruit with a smile on our face, letting the light of Christ in our eyes become something others can count on in their darkest hours. And as they see light manifest in our countenances, they will be drawn to it. We can then help refocus their attention to the original source of love and light, the bright and morning star, Jesus Christ. I bear my testimony that this, all of this, is going to turn out so much better than we could ever imagine. With an eye of faith on Jesus Christ, may we see that everything will be all right in the end and feel that it will be all right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We are grateful to all who have given us such remarkable and positive teachings this evening. And to the young single adult choir for the beautiful music they have provided. Our concluding speaker for this session will be Elder Ulysses Sawaris of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Following his remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing Arise, O God, and shine. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Juan Pablo Villar of the Seventy. My dear friends, we have had marvelous conference sessions today. We have all felt the spirit of the Lord and His love through the wonderful messages shared by our leaders. I feel privileged to address you this evening as the concluding speaker of this session. And I pray that the spirit of the Lord continues with us as we rejoice together as true brothers and sisters in Christ. Our dear prophet, Russell M. Nelson, declared, I call upon our members everywhere to lead out in abandoning attitudes and actions of prejudice. I plead with you to promote respect for all of God's children. As a global and ever-growing ever church, following this invitation from our prophet is a vital prerequisite for building the Savior's kingdom in every nation of the world. The Gospel of Jesus Christ te teaches that we are all begotten spirits, sons and daughters of heavenly parents who truly loves us and that we lived as a family in God's presence before we were born on this earth. The Gospel also teaches that we were all created in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, we are equal before Him. For he hath made of one blood all nations of men and women. Therefore, we all have divine nature, heritage, and potential. For there is one God and Father of all, who is above all, 
and through all and in us all. As disciples of Christ, we are invited to increase our faith in and love for our spiritual brother and sisterhood by genuinely knitting our hearts together in unity and love, regardless of our differences, thereby increasing our ability to promote respect for the dignity of all the sons and daughters of God. Wasn't that exactly the condition that the people of Nephi experienced for almost two centuries after Christ ministered to them? And surely there could not be a happier people among the all people who had been created by the hand of God, neither were there Lamanites nor any manner of ites, but they were in one, the children of Christ and heirs to the kingdom of God. And how blessed were they. President Nelson further emphasized the importance of spreading dignity and respect for our fellow beings when he stated, the creator of all us calls on each of us to abandon attitudes of prejudice against any group of God's children. Any of us who has prejudice toward another race need to repent. It behooves each of us to do whatever we can in our spheres of influence to preserve the dignity and respect every son and daughter of God deserves. In reality, human dignity presupposes respect for our differences. Considering the sacred bond that unifies us with God as His children, this prophetic direction given by President Nelson is undoubtedly a fundamental step toward building bridges of understanding rather than creating walls of prejudice and segregation among us. However, as Paul warned the Ephesians, we must recognize that in order to achieve this purpose, it will be required to make an individual and collective effort to act with loneliness, meekness, and long-suffering toward one another. There is a tale of a certain Jewish rabbi who was enjoying the sunrise with two friends. He asked them, how do you know when the night is over and a new day has begun? One of them replied, when you can look into the east and can distinguish a ship from a goat. The other then responded, when you can look into the horizon and distinguish an olive tree from a fig tree. They then turned to the wise rabbi and asked him the same question. After long reflection, he replied, when you can look into the east and see the face of a man and can say, she is my sister, he is my brother. My dear friends, I can assure you that the light of a new day shines brighter in our lives when we see and treat our fellow beings with respect and dignity and as true brothers and sisters in Christ. During his earthly ministry, Jesus so perfectly exemplified this principle as he went about doing good unto all people, inviting them to come unto him and partake of his goodness, regardless of their origin, social class, or cultural characteristics. He ministered, healed, and was always attentive to everyone's needs, especially those who at the time were considered different, belittled, or excluded. He denied none, but treated them with equity and love. For he saw them as his brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of the same father. One of the most striking occasions when this occurred was when the Savior traveled to Galilee, pur purposely taking the route which passed through Samaria. Jesus then decided to sit by the Jacob's well to rest. While there, 
a Samaritan woman approached to fill her pitcher with water. In his omniscience, Jesus addressed her, saying, Give me to drink. This woman was amazed that a Jew had asked a Samaritan woman for assistance and expressed her surprise, saying, How is that thou, being a Jew, asked drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. But Jesus, abandoning the long-held traditions of animosity between Samaritans and Jews, lovingly ministered to this woman, helping her to understand who he truly was, that is, the Messiah who would tell all things and whose coming she was awaiting. The impact of that tender ministry caused the woman run, to run into the city to announce to the people what had happened, saying, Is not this the Christ? I have deep compassion <clears throat> for those who have been mistreated, belittled, or persecuted by unfeeling and thoughtless people, because in the course of my life, I've, I've seen firsthand the pain good people suffer from being judged or dismissed because they happen to speak, look, or live differently. I also feel genuine sorrow in my heart for those who minds, whose minds remain darkened, whose vision is limited, and whose hearts remain hardened by the belief in the inferiority of those who are different from them. Their limited view of others actually obstructs their ability to see who they are as children of God. As foretold by the prophets, we are living in the perilous days leading up to the second coming of the Savior. The world in general is polarized by strong divisions accentuated by racial, political, and socioeconomic lines. Such divisions sometimes end up influencing people's way of thinking and acting in relation to their fellow being. For this reason, it is not uncommon to see people characterizing their way of thinking, acting, and speaking of other cultures, races, and ethnicities as inferior, making use of preconceived, mistaken, and often sarcastic ideas generating attitudes of contempt, indifference, disrespect, and even prejudice against them. Such attitudes have their roots in pride, arrogance, envy, and jealousy, characteristics of a carnal nature which are totally contrary to Christ-like attributes. This conduct is improper for those who are striving to become His true disciples. In fact, my dear brothers and sisters, there is no place for prejudiced thoughts or actions in the community of saints. As sons and daughters of the covenant, we can help to eliminate this kind of behavior by looking at the apparent differences that exist between us with the Savior's eyes and based on what we have in common, our divine identity and kinship. Moreover, we can strive to see ourselves reflected in the dreams, hopes, sorrows, and pains of our neighbor. We are all fellow travelers as God's children, equal in our imperfect state and in our ability to grow. We are invited to walk together peaceably with our hearts filled with love toward God and all men. Or, as Abraham Lincoln noted, with malice toward none and charity for all. Have you ever pondered on how the principle of respect for human dignity and equality is demonstrated to the simple, through the simple way we dress in the house of the Lord? We all come to the temple united in one purpose, filled with the desire to be pure and holy in His holy presence. Dressed in white, all of us are received by the Lord Himself as His beloved children, men and women of God, 
progeny of Christ. We are privileged to perform the same ordinances, make the same covenants, commit ourselves to live higher and holier lives, and receive the same eternal promises. United in purpose, we see one another with new eyes, and in our oneness, we celebrate our differences as divine children of God. I recently helped guide dignitaries and government officials through the open house for the Brasilia Brazil Temple. I paused in the changing area with the Vice President of Brazil, and we discussed the white clothing that everyone wears inside the temple. I explained to him that this universal use of white clothing symbolizes that we are all alike unto God and that in the temple, our identities were not vice president of a country or a church leader, but our eternal identity as sons of a loving Heavenly Father. The Iguazu River flows through southern Brazil and empties into a plateau that forms a system of waterfalls known worldwide as the Iguazu Falls, one of the most beautiful and impressive of God's creations on earth, considered one of the seven wonders of the world. A colossal volume of water flows into a single river and then separates, forming hundreds of unparalleled waterfalls. Metaphorically speaking, this phenomenal system of waterfalls is a reflection of God's family on earth, for we share the same spiritual origin and sub substance derived from our divine heritage and kinship. However, each of us flows in different cultures, ethnicities, and nationalities with different opinions, experiences, and feelings. Despite this, we move forward as God's children and as brothers and sisters in Christ without losing our divine connection, which makes us a unique people and a beloved community. My dear brothers and sisters, may we align our hearts and minds with the knowledge and testimony that we are all equal before God that we are all fully endowed with the same eternal potential and inheritance. May we enjoy more the spiritual kinship that exists between us and value the different attributes and varied gifts we all have. If we do so, I promise you that we will flow in our own way, as does the, the water of the Iguazu Falls, without losing our divine connection that identifies us as a peculiar people, the children of Christ and heirs of the kingdom of God. I testify to you that as we continue to flow this way during our mortal life, a new day will begin with a new light that will brighten our lives and illuminate wonderful opportunities to value more and be more fully blessed by the diversity cre created by God among His children. We will surely become instruments in His hands to promote respect and dignity among all His sons and daughters. God lives. Jesus is the Savior of the world. President Nelson is the prophet of God in our day. I bear witness of these truths in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Our dear Heavenly Father, at the conclusion of this session and this conference day, we are deeply grateful for all the messages that we have received and we have heard this day. We are grateful for thy gospel and the restored truth that we have access to. We are grateful for prophets, seers, and revelators, and for the guidance that we receive from them for our life. We are grateful for thy Son, Jesus Christ, and his infinite atonement and sacrifice. Dear Father, we ask for thy love and help to live according to the messages that we have received, according to the inspiration, thoughts, and feelings that we have received today also. We ask for thy blessings upon President Russell M. Nelson and Elder Jeffrey R. Holland, and the member of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Father, we love thee, and we ask for thy strength and help so we can live according to the teachings and promptings that we have received today. We ask for thy help to not be merely hearers, but doers of thy word. And we say these things in the name of thy Son, our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the Saturday evening session of the 193rd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session was provided by a choir comprised of young single adults residing in Utah County. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. <laughs>